Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. What, what's an imperative? If something is in the imperative mood, what, what does that mean? Like in, in your Spanish class or your French a class? Command. Yeah, very good. It's a command. So I am wearing a tie that's indicative, we would say in, in English. Um, wear a tie. That's a, a command, right? Um, if you're going to go to a job interview, you should wear a tie. Kant would say that's also an imperative, too. Um, so really, anything that's going to have ought or should will be some kind of imperative, some kind of telling you what to do. And you've been given a lot of imperatives. Right? You still get them all the time, and you'll get them the rest of your life. The IRS is going to tell you, you should pay this amount of taxes, and if you don't, then we'll penalize you. Um, you know, you go to a, a game, the cop is going to tell you, go that way, rather than go that way. Um, the ticket people are going to tell you, come up, let me frisk you. You know, you, you get that sort of thing all the time. Um, but you give yourself imperatives too, don't you? Do you ever tell yourself you should do something? You always do what you tell yourself you should? No? Some of you nod yes. If you do, then you're, you're pretty well off, provided you've got the right imperatives. Um, if you don't, then you're pretty much like most people. You know, we're not, we're not perfectly constant, Kant would say. So now, how can we think of imperatives? Um, Kant says we have to think about them. If we want to understand moral life, we have to understand it in terms of imperatives. And that's the kind of beings that we are. We're rational beings, right? We can reason. That's why we can have imperatives. You can give the dog imperatives. You can say, sit. You know, and then you give it a cookie, and the dog, after a while, figures out that if it keeps doing that, it's going to keep getting cookies. And after a while, you don't have to give it cookies anymore. Um, but you, you know, you're different than the dog. The dog never actually tells itself, I should sit now, because I would like a cookie. It just sort of does it, right? Um, Kant says you're unique because as a rational being, you can give laws to yourself, which means you can tell yourself what to do. <clears throat> so, you know, think about today. All of you are here. It's 3.45 on a Tuesday afternoon, kind of dreary. Um, you could be in bed right now, or you could be watching TV, <clears throat> maybe doing both. Or you could uh, be off in the library reading about something that you're more interested in doing work for other classes, you actually made yourself come here. You told yourself this is a good thing to do. Even if you don't, you know, you weren't completely convinced that it was a great idea or anything like that, you at least said, well, I should do it. But I'm willing to bet that at this point in the semester, some of you had some second thoughts about it, right? And you were like, eh, I don't know, you know, I've, I've got so many absences I could take. Maybe this would be a good day for a sick day. You know, we all do that sort of thing. Um, but you, you gave yourself an imperative. You told yourself this is the right thing to do. Now, the question then that you can ask is, well, why? And there's a lot of ways that you can arrange this or think about this. Kant breaks them down into to three basic groups. And before he does that, he breaks them into categorical imperatives and hypothetical imperatives. So these are some, some technical terms that we want to sort of get down before we delve into it. And a lot of the technical terms when it comes to this, we can probably set aside. But these two are absolutely essential. So hypothetical, I think you guys are more familiar with that. If you say, if somebody asks you something and you say, hypothetically, yes, you're not really committing yourself, right? Are you going to go to the, uh, the party next Friday? Hypothetically. And now you notice I've got this if then. Right? Well, if these things happen, or if these conditions hold, then yes, I'll go there. 
Um, do, you, do you need to wear a tie? Not a lot of parties you need to wear ties to anymore, right? But let's say it's a tie party. Uh, it says that right on the invitation, everyone must wear a tie. So you say, well, if I want to go to that party, got to get myself a tie, and I've got to actually put it on. Maybe I'll take it off halfway through or something once I get in the door, but I'm going to wear the tie. Or you could ask yourself, if I'm going to teach a class, you could ask yourself a question like, if I'm going to teach a class, should I wear a tie or not? You know, I, I ask my wife these, these, these sort of questions, not about classes, because I've got that down, but you know, places we're going to go. What, can I, what should I wear? Is it okay to wear jeans? Do I have to wear dress shoes? Do I need to wear a tie? You know, it was a big adjustment for me to come here and find out that you, know, you can go just about anywhere you want so long as you've got a pair of nice jeans on and you know, decent shoes, you can just wear like a t-shirt and then a sports jacket. And everybody thinks that's, that's a okay because other places I've lived, you know, you look ridiculous. But around here, you know, apparently that's the, the hip thing to do uh, if you're an academic. And so you can, you know, arrange those sort of things in terms of hypotheticals. Well, if you're in this environment, then you should wear this. Right? None of you are wearing ties today, right? Or, you know, fancy power suits or whatever. I, I don't even know what, what, what other equivalents we could have for that. Um, some of you are wearing sweats, some of you are wearing, you know, sort of casual stuff, some of you are a little bit more dressy, you know, uh, I guess that's a sweater, right, kind of, <coughs> something like that. Um, you know, you can ask yourself, is this, the, is this the thing to wear for the classroom, you know, uh, well, you know, what does it depend on? Do you need to wear a tie in order to learn ethics? I don't think so. Do you need to dress up for it? Probably not. I didn't dress up when I learned it. I only started dressing up when I started teaching it, you know? Um, so, you know, there, there's all these conditions that you can ask about. They're hypothetical. They don't hold in every single case. And Kant breaks those down into two different types. Um, so first he talks about actions that we do for the sake of some other goal. Well, he talks about a doctor, right? Doctors have to know a lot of different things. Some of you are, are, are I think if I remember right, at least one of you is pre-med or Something along those lines. Um, really, anything that you guys are studying, you have to know a lot of things in your major. You, you started that started to dawn on you by now, right? This part of junior year when now you're taking a lot of major classes, and you're like, oh man, a lot of work involved in this. Well, because you're learning your skill, you're learning your trade, and it just so happens that a lot of your trades have been around for hundreds of years, so people you know know a little bit about that sort of. Sort of thing, um, but it's all matters, you know, doing doing something in order to bring about some other result. So if you're a doctor, what's your goal in general? Yeah. Oh yeah, um, yeah, and, and you could also say to make money or things like that. But I mean, what is it, what is a characteristic about a doctor? What do they do? Take care. Right. So they're they're part of what we call the um, caring professions or actually a fancy word for it. I'm not sure if I can even pronounce it right. The uh, alimosery. No, I can't even pronounce it. It comes from the Greek word for, for pity, to take pity on other people. Nurses fit in there. Uh, EMTs fit in there. Uh, alimosery? Uh, yeah. If you're a doctor, why do you do the things that you do? To try to bring about this end of healing people. And you might have other ends too, like have your own practice someday. Those of you who are going to become teachers, what's what's your product? What's your uh, your racket about? Teach other, teach other kids. Yeah, you, some knowledge should actually occur, some learning. The kids should leave your classroom at the end of the semester better informed than they were before. Um, if you want that to happen, are there things that you should do? Like what? Let's take the teacher example. What should you do? Yeah. Okay, that's pretty high level stuff right there. Um, that's, that's better than like showing up, making sure you have a lesson plan. Uh, differentiate the classroom so that you attend to the needs of all the different types of learners. Some people are more tactile, some people are more kinesthetic, some people are you know, 
work well with charts. Yeah, I mean, if you're doing that, you're probably doing a lot of other things along the way too, right? Because if you want to do that, you can say, well, what do you have to do in order to do that? If you take that as, its, as an end, <coughs> how many other things do you have to do along the way? Quite a few. You actually have to know about learning styles, right? You have to have some proficiency. Now, what if you're a car mechanic? Do you need to care about learning styles? Or differentiating your, maybe your customers according to learning styles? No, you don't? You're right, you don't. Well, for a car, you would have to change your ah, style yeah. of fixing Then, like, when you're explaining it to people, like... Not all car mechanics actually explain things. But, yeah, but, like, but still, like, you know, like, yeah. like, if there's somebody who knows a lot about cars, or it's like, like, like you're a car mechanic, you know that person knows a lot, you're going to be like, you can tell them exactly what was wrong. Yeah. But if it's like me, like, I don't know anything, like, you should be like, well, this is what, like, this is what's kind of, like, I mean, it's not yeah. like he's going to in depth. But Imagine... Imagine the human body and your car is like this. Your car's liver is bad. Yeah. That sort of thing. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. This is just a total side note, but in every profession, some of the best people in the profession are um, good teachers. So, you know, a good car mechanic actually teaches. Um, I've got a friend who's a salesman. No, he sells good products. It helps if you're going to sell a good product so you don't have to lie to people and all that. And he sees his job not so much as doing sales as educating his customers and helping them reason out what they, they ought to buy. Um, and you see that in a lot of different fields, you know. Um, it's kind of funny, I knew a police officer once who talked about himself being a salesman. And he talked about his job as selling people jail terms. Because um, he was an interrogator. And he would talk to them and get them to sort of reveal information. He'd always pretend he was just some dumb seller They'd, they'd start talking down to him and then they'd reveal a lot of stuff. He was also really good at, at sort of educating people. And he, he kind of, he'd educate people after he, um, after he got their confession about, now here's how the process is going to work. And they understood it pretty well. Um, but now all of these are just merely hypothetical. You know, if you want to do this sort of thing, then you should do this. Then this should be the case. So if you're going to be a teacher, then yeah, you should do all these things. That's good for you to do. Because it leads to this end. If you're going to be a car mechanic, maybe you have a lot of other ends. If you're going to be a police officer, you have other ends, right? Um, if you're going to wash chalkboards for a living, if there was such a, a job, then you have a much more restricted set of ends that you're, you're after. Now, the problem with trying to get morality out of this is that there, there's always the question, well, what if you don't want those ends? What if it doesn't apply to you? Any of the shoulds that you can get from what he's calling rules of skill, they're merely hypothetical. They're not actually applying to everybody across the board. So they may, you know, remember when we talked about um, duties coming out of roles? Kant is rejecting that sort of thing. Um, let's go a little bit higher now in thinking about this. So there is something that we all do want, happiness. Things. Now he understands it a little bit differently than Aristotle did or Mill did. He understands happiness as being the satis as he calls it the satisfaction of all your inclinations and desires. And we talked about this a little bit. It's not the same for, for you necessarily as it is for me, and nor is it the same for you as the person sitting next to you. We have different inclinations and desires. But there are some that we tend to share in common, right? What are some really basic things that I think we could say we all do want? Part of the good life for us. Any of you want to be totally alone? No friends, no family, that's your ideal of, you know. I mean, if you have a huge family, there may be some times where you're like, man, I'd like to get away from these people for a while, but um, that's just for a while, that's not forever, right? There's a difference between going off and being alone and being totally without people, being lonely. Maybe that's part of, you know, what we ought to seek out. So somebody like Aristotle or Mill would say. Um, are there other things that we need? I mean, you need a certain amount of wealth, don't you? Any, any of you want to be bums on the street? No? I think we can agree we need a certain amount of wealth. A certain amount of maybe property or 
opportunities or things like that. But it's going to be a bit different for each of us, isn't it? Um, and when it comes to our tastes, are we, any, are we similar to each other? We may have some things in common. There are going to be some movies we agree on, but some of us may like movies more, some of us may not care about movies. Some of us may only watch the genre of movies. Same thing with music, same thing with TV shows, same thing with do you go and watch plays or not? What sports do you like? Um, pick any of these sort of things that we consume, and happiness starts to look like um, something quite varied. Are you even sure what all your desires and inclinations are at this point? Context that it's pretty hard to figure out exactly what you want. So that's going to be a problem. I mean, there are some things that you can figure out that you should do or you ought to do, and they're what we call counsels of prudence, meaning that it's, it's prudent, it's likely to lead you to happiness uh, if you do those sort of things. But you're not quite sure what happiness looks like, right? And so he talks about this, this is a really nice passage. Um, he says, um, If it were only easy to give a definite conception of happiness, the imperatives of prudence would correspond exactly with those of skill. For in this case, it, as in that, it could be said whoever wills the end wills also the indispensable means. But unfortunately, the notion of happiness is so indefinite that although every person wishes to attain it, each one of you is motivated by the desire for happiness, but you're not quite sure what that is. You have some ideas of it, and you have some ideas of what's going to make you unhappy, but well, this is a bad thing to say, but um, you don't even know the things that are going to make you unhappy five years from now, because you know they're not even really on your horizon yet. So he says, um, the reason of this is the elements which belong to the notion of happiness are altogether empirical. Well, they're things of this world, things that we experience. When we say empirical, that means that we experience it. And they have to be borrowed for experience. So what are some examples? He says, well, do you will riches uh, to be, you know, not just financially independent, but to have a lot of money? Well, is that going to necessarily make you happy? That might bring about anxiety and envy. You don't want that, do you? What about knowledge and discernment? I think all of you are after knowledge, otherwise you wouldn't be here in college. But that might only prove, he says, prove to be only an eye so much the sharper to show him so much more the fearfully the evils that are now concealed from him. Think about some of the classes that you took that opened your eyes to things and then afterwards you were a little bit depressed. Did you have any classes like that so far? Like maybe a psychology class or an economics class or, you know, all sorts of things. You thought you were, you know, really doing well before and then you take a class and you're like, oh, man. According to Plato, my life is meaningless. I better figure out what to do. Um, well, you know, knowledge doesn't always bring you happiness. We think it might, but it doesn't always. What about a long life? Could be a long, bad life, couldn't it? Um, and he goes on and on with this. And he says, so these sorts of things, these merely experiential principles, are not actually going to be enough to orient us for morality. They're, they do tell us what's good for us in a sense, but they don't tell us what's morally good. If we want what's morally good, we have to turn to categorical imperatives. So now here's, again, a term that you probably don't use very much. If you're being categorical with somebody, you're saying this holds absolutely. There's no qualifications. There's no uh, exemptions or exceptions to the rule. You're saying this applies to everyone. So if I say uh, it's a categorical rule that all students must hand in a final exam, I'm saying it applies to all of you. No, you know, no, no special uh, dispensations from it or anything like that. Um, so when you're when you're issuing a categorical statement or command or imperative, you're saying it holds universally. If, if that helps you to say universal instead of categorical, that, I think that would be perfectly fine to, to change the word for you. Um, now, a categorical imperative doesn't tell you to do an action for the sake of some other thing. Like, you want to make your patient better, uh, you should do this. Because, you know, it could be you don't want to make your patient better. Maybe you want to make your patient worse. In that case, that's not going to hold. 
a categorical imperative is going to hold in every case. So I suppose if you were you know, dealing with doctors, you could say, well, you ought to always make your patient better. And you know, for somebody to ask, well, why should I make my patient better? Maybe it's not going to make me you know, some money or you know, expand my practice or get me the grant that I want. You'd be kind of missing the point. You'd be saying, I'm, I'm treating it like a hypothetical when it's really a categorical command. You know, I, I think that, that in the Hippocratic Oath for Doctors, you guys are all familiar with this, right? What's, what's sort of the one big injunction for, for them? Do harm. Don't do harm, yeah. First I thought you said do no. harm. <laughs> <It's horrible. laughs> um, yeah, do no harm, right? That's a categorical statement. It's not saying do no harm unless it's one of those kind of situations where you think it might be justified. Um, or do no harm because that way you'll become rich. Or do no harm because it'll make you feel like a good person. It's just saying do no harm. That's what makes it categorical, right? And if you start introducing other things, it loses that status. As soon as you start saying, what would be another example? Um, well, let's take lying, for example. If you say to somebody when they're a kid, don't lie. It's wrong for you to lie. Kant does, by the way, think it's always wrong to lie. Um, immediately the kid asks why, right? That's, that's what kids do. Those of you who are going to be teachers, you're going to be faced with that all the time. Um, now if you actually answer that, Kant says, and, and you're not just saying, look, it's wrong, and I want you to understand that it's wrong, but you say something like, well, if you lie, people aren't going to like you, Kant thinks that you're actually taking the kid in the wrong direction. Morality has to do with this stuff up here, not with this stuff down here. You know? so, now think about this. Somebody like Mill would say, well, it's okay to lie in certain circumstances if it's going to promote the greatest happiness. Right? Kant would say, you can never lie. It's always going to be wrong. That's what it means for a statement to be, a, you know, a command to be categorical. So the action is done for its own sake because it's the right thing to do. This is, this is why it's a deontological type of ethics. Do you guys all see that? If you have a deontological ethics, you have to sooner or later tell somebody what the duties actually are, and you have to express them in some way. This is one way to do it. It's very clear. Um, and at a certain point, it, it may be satisfying, very satisfying for you, or it may be very unsatisfying because you might be one of the people who wants to know, well, why should I do things this way? That leads us to a different issue then. So that's where we're going to actually try to figure out, well, what is a category?